Welcome to First United Methodist Church and its worship service. It's good to see you and good to have you with us today. We uh, probably, you'll probably notice there's a different face standing here uh, in front of you. We have uh, Pastor Mike is on a vacation and we'll be back next week. So I just want to share a few uh, announcements with you as we get started. First of all, I want to remind you that next Sunday, we're going to have worship on Sunday here in this, this beautiful sanctuary. So we hope that you uh, will prayerfully consider whether or not you will be attending uh, next week. We're also going to be live streaming that service as well as YouTube. So you have a chance to see and be a part of that service in of the three, either of those three ways. Please check the color codes on Saturday night to see whether or not our service will, will be live. Also, I want to say to you that today I would like to lift up the fact that we on Sunday would have be having World Communion Sunday, which is a very special Sunday in the life of the historic church. And I really regret that we're not going to be able to do that. But nevertheless, I'd just like to lift it up, lift it up and celebrate with you the, the beauty of, of the concept of that uh, service that goes worldwide with all denominations and religious affiliations. So we give thanks for that. Today, as we get started, I would like to read a piece of poetry from Hafiz, a Persian Muslim who wrote beautiful poetry years and years and years ago. It's entitled, I Wish I Could Speak Like Music. I wish I could speak like music. I wish I could put the swaying splendor of the fields into words so that you could hold truth against your body and dance. I am trying the best I can with this crude brush, the tongue, to cover you with light. I wish I could speak like divine music. I want to give you the sublime rhythms of this earth and the sky's limbs as they joyously spin and surrender, surrender against God's luminous breath. Let us worship.
Will you join me in our responsive call to worship this morning? God has given us this beautiful earth and all that grows and runs upon it. Thanks be to God. God has given us breath to live and spirit to sing. Thanks be to God. God has gathered us into a community of care and worship. Let us worship God with love, thanksgiving, and praise. Our opening hymn this morning is found in the Methodist hymnal on page 128, He Leadeth Me, O Blessed Thought. Let us pray together. Holy God, source of all that is, creator, lover, compassionate, 
who creates not only this world but this universe and who searches us out and yearns to communicate his love for us. We gather as your people. We come with thanksgiving in our hearts, knowing full well that the life that we've been given is a pure gift. We come also, Lord God, realizing that we were in a different time. We come with the recognition that so many changes around us and so many struggles and challenges to adapt to a new and different time and a different world. Yet nevertheless, we know that there's also been other times, other eras, other places, where we've also, as a common race, have struggled with change. And so we pray for every person going through their difficult moments, for those who feel despair, for those who feel lost, for those who are without money, for those who are in conflict, for those who struggle with the meaning of their life as it's changed. We ask that you will be with those who work so hard to care for others. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will bless all the people around this world who need you and who are searching you out, who need help and who need healing. We ask that you will bless this congregation and we pray that you will be with us as we also respond to the challenge of what it means to be your church in this day and in this time. Help us to look to you for insight and wisdom and new ways of looking at how we can reach others. We thank you for the gifts of the leadership of this church and pray for each one of this congregation as they go through these difficult times as well. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear the scripture from the book of James, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with the bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, Yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our, placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body sets on fire the cycle of nature and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of breast, a beast and bird, a reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and black brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. This is the word of God for the people of God this holy day. Thanks be to God.
Thought I'd preach from up here. It's a little more comfortable for someone who's been preaching from a pulpit for 60 some years and getting acquainted and getting adjusted to a new reality and a new way of doing church and doing worship. So I thought I would try it from up here. It was a word spoken. It was spoken before creation. It was spoken out of chaos and out of non-being. The world and humanity was shaped by a word. The book is Genesis, the beginning of the Bible. It's the story of creation and how God said, let there be. And God speaks and the world comes into being. Over 1900 times a word is spoken, I understand. God gives humanity then the power of speech. The power even to name the creatures of the earth. To create language and in doing so, in creating language, God then continues his creative activity in the world. Jesus knew that. Jesus also, in the book of John, was announced as the Word becoming flesh. That, he, that in the beginning was what? Was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And so Jesus uses words to create a new world, a new reality, a new understanding of life, and introduces the good news of the gospel. Writer James, who is a teacher himself, who is a Jewish Christian, probably the brother of Jesus, I suspect, maybe the one that was head of the church during the time of Paul. This James who writes this book, he knows all about Genesis. He knows the connection between speech and creation and the original intent of a loving God. And so it is out of that context, out of that foundation, he speaks to the early church. How are we to live together, he wonders. Well, he speaks to the teachers because teachers were very prevalent and significant in that era of the church, the early rabbis, if you will. And so he talks about the danger of the tongue. He talks about the danger of language. He talks about the danger of how we treat one another. And he points out, you know, that one dead moment we can be praising God with all our might and the next moment we can be downing and condemning our brothers and sisters in this world. Out of the same mouth comes the same kind of thing. And so he is saying to us that we need to understand the power of, of the tongue. How it's like a spark that creates a forest fire. And we all know about forest fires recently. It's like a rudder on a boat. It's like the bit in the horse's mouth, powerful, yet very, very small. And so it is today, we need to talk about how our words have power. You know, words can paint beautiful pictures. They can share significant feelings that we have. They can help us dream. They designate eras of culture. For example, I'm a product of the 50s and 60s. I know all their songs. I know all their habits. I, I know their language style. I even know how they used to have their hair. I know about the King James Version of the Bible. Some believe that Jesus would use that Bible, not knowing the historic differences between 1600s and, and the beginning of, of, the, of the Christian era. I've been to churches where you couldn't use any other Bible but the King James Version. If you did, you got kicked out of that church. You were, I, I know a preacher who, who had read from his new Revised Standard Version, and the next Sunday he came, there was a King James Version on his altar. So that they got, he had to have, he got the word of what he was supposed to do. There are unknown tongues, I understand. There are places that reveal just a lot about us. And with our language. It shows sometimes what our job is. It 
talks about it, we understand our values and our purpose in life. It comes through the kind of language that we use. Language is a symbol system holding life together in an unbelievable uh, way with a lot of stuff behind it. But James not only wants his readers in the church to understand the source of that powerful image of what communication does and language, he also especially warns us that the tongue has the power to destroy. I came across a prayer the other day. It goes like this. Well, so far today, Lord, I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. Haven't been greedy or grumpy or nasty or selfish or overindulgent. I am a very, I'm a very thankful person for that. But in a few minutes, Lord, I'm going to get out of bed. And from then on, I'm going to need a lot of help. Well, the church and humanity needs a lot of help to get out of bed and to respond. Somebody wrote this about, about language and about gossip and about the tongue. He wrote, I am more deadly than the screaming shell of the cannon. I win without killing. I tear down homes, I break hearts, and I rack lives. I travel on the wings of the wind. No innocent is strong enough to intimidate me. No purity pure enough to daunt me. I have no regard after truth. No respect for justice. No mercy for the defenseless. My victims are as numerous as the sands of the sea and often as innocent. I never forget us, I never forgive, and I seldom forget. You know, there's an old saying that we all grew up with, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That ain't true. That just is not true. I remember as a, at one time in my life, I was a district superintendent supervising churches, 200 churches in, in an area near here. And you know some of the most hurtful things that I've ever had said to me were said to me by church people. Do you ever play gossip? You know the, how you do that. You have a circle of people and you whisper in one guy, person's ear out here a, something, a sentence that you want to say and then they, you get them to whisper all around and see, and see what comes out on the other side. You know what happens there. It, does, it isn't the same thing. I saw, I heard about a cartoon the other day, and it showed a line of church pews, one, two, three, four, and then they, they had a sentence for each church pew. The sentence one was, first pew, my ear hurts. The second pew, the pastor has an earache. In the third pew, the pastor got a hearing aid. Pew four. The pastor is having trouble hearing. Pew five, the pastor's got a double earring. Pew six, an old lady with a cane is walking out and says, that does it, I'm out of here. The pastor's got a double earring. Well, I guess the question we could ask, has your tongue ever got you in trouble? Has it ever spread half truth stories? Has it ever contributed to the pain of other people? Have you ever participated unknowingly maybe or unwittingly or maybe intentionally reacting and saying things about other people that were hurtful and destructive? Some say that the things that have been said to us when we were young get stuck with us. They get stuck down inside of us and we can't let them go. And the truth happens so many times that we live out of things that have been said to us in our early days of our lives. We live out of them our entire life. We never get over them. 
because of the destructiveness of something somebody has said with their tongue. The tongue has weaponized social media. There's all kinds of ugliness that goes on in the social media. Some people seem like they're as free to say anything they want to say, no matter how untruthful it is or how hurtful it is or how much it is in your face. Somebody has said that language in our day is like the new Tower of Babel. Take advertising, for example. You and I know that advertising has that slippery half-truth slope about it that, de that is decess deceptive and seductive. You don't read the fine print, you're in trouble. But we're in the political season, and I don't really want to talk about that, but there are advertisements for politicians and messages in public and on the air that precisely try to sell a candidate uh, by sharing some of the most uh, unhelpful and untruthful things in order to somehow craft a, a, a way of talking about them that will appeal to, to other people. Finally, the tongue also has the power to bless. We can model the life of faith with our tongue. We can pay attention to the words we use. We can build up the body of Christ. We can build up the community. We can encourage others. They say that one criticism overwhelms 20 positive affirmations. I think that's true. They say that, that one writer, for example, said that he had uh, trouble in his church and was stressful and he was worried about it. So he got a fellowship of people together to talk about stress and the negative things that people were saying and the conflicts that they were having. And so he created a special formula uh, to, to get people involved and to agree upon whenever they were talking with people or with, uh, there was something controversial coming. And so he said, before I respond, ask these questions. Is what I'm going to say to them true? Is what I'm going to say in response, is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it even necessary to respond? Is it kind? You know, uh, I, I lived in uh, a town in, in where I served where there was a very well-known pastor that was years before me that was very much loved in that church. He was a good man, a good Christian man that just, I, I adored him personally. And he was in this church a long time, the church I later served. And one Sunday in worship, he goes into the pulpit, opens his Bible, and a note was there. And the note read, you've been here long enough. When are you leaving? Right before the service. And that just devastated that man. It was never the same since. What we say okay, can be so destructive. I had another story about my superintending days. It seems like that's on my mind today. I, as a district superintendent, had the, had responsibility in churches to, to have charge conference. Now, in the United Methodist Church, that's really seen with somewhat, some dread, I think, in the fall. But I had this idea where I would talk about spiritual gifting. And so I started, and I did the spiritual gifting uh, uh, workshop and with the pastors, and then was going to, what we're going to do is go to all the churches and see what their spiritual gifts were, where they clumped, where they clustered, and then to celebrate and charge conference what they were doing and out of their spiritual gifting and what they could do in the future based upon the passion that they had because of the gifts that God had given that church. But as I was doing that, when I did my own spiritual gifting uh, workshop, 
I discovered that my spiritual gift was encouragement. And my first response to that was, ah, I was not impressed. And so I shared that with, with the pastors and, and that I was not impressed with, with what, what came out of that. And one after one said to me, Harry, don't you realize what you do? And they talked about the many, many ways that I had encouraged the church, how I, how I had worked with churches and ministers about their, their, their vision and their purpose and saw them through hard times. And then I said, well, yeah, I guess that's right. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. Years later, when I, would, when I retired, I was in an annual conference, and I was attending, and, uh, and this pastor wrote a note to me and sent it across the aisle to me, and she, she said, just want, you, just want you to know again <laughs> what you mean to me when you were a superintendent. And she went on to say some of the gifts that I had. And I thought, wow, you know, I need that so much. And so I brought that home, and it's still in my office, and it's still at a very special place. My dear friends, instead of tearing people down, we need to encourage them. We need to celebrate their lives. We need to celebrate their uniqueness. We need to give thanks for them. We need to find ways to listen and to find ways to encourage the church in a difficult time. I, uh, I believe that, Jesus, that James is calling us to live changed lives, to live lives that emulate the, the language of faith in a world that does not necessarily talk in the language of faith. For us not only to keep that alive and energetic and, and helpful to the church, but to find a passion in our congregations that sees a positive and hopeful outcome. I want that for this church. I want it for all churches. Thanks be to God. May I pray together. Pray with you. Oh Lord, we lift up all the congregations that you have given, and we pray that you will bless them with positive, encouraging people who live in faith and are responding to this world with hopefulness. We ask your blessings upon them all in the name of Christ. Amen. We come to this time of offering. We're reminded and encouraged to continue sending your gifts and tithes to the church. Um, in the bulletin today, we're reminded of our um, Friends Feeding Friends um, outreach, as well as some of the other outreaches um, and opportunities that we have to serve others in our community. Um, we do this through our offering as well as our service and our encouragement as well. So I encourage you to send your offerings to the address that's seen on the screen. We're pleased and blessed to have Laurie Wyant with us today who's going to be singing the familiar Michael W. Smith uh, worship anthem, Great is the Lord. We ask that you give generously.
gracious God, we thank you for the gifts that you give us. We thank you for the spirit of encouragement, which allows us to give those gifts with a generous heart, with an encouraging mouth. Help us to always be mindful of that which you give. Help us to be mindful of the ways in which we share our gifts with others, and in which that giving and that sharing empowers others to do the same. Continue to bless us, for we ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And our closing hymn this morning is found in the Methodist hymnal on page 468, Dear Jesus, in Whose Life I See. I send you forth to remember that words matter. Watch your tongue, watch your language, because we're participating in the holy language of faith, and we are inviting others to hear good news. And in this world that so desperately needs it, we are the people that give praise and witness to the one who is Father and God of us all, and has called us to serve in this world, in this time. Let us do it. Amen.